It's a pleasure to welcome everyone tonight to our special Shior special, and that we're not doing the Parsha, we're doing Al Sheikh on Esther. And I can tell you that my studies have been, as always, very rewarding. And I cannot say that I've finished his parish on Esther because it's 120 pages, long pages as well in my edition. So it's really a full length, uh, it's really a book in its own right, full length commentary. And um, certainly, as we always do, we're going to just uh, go on some selections, naturally. And uh, so let's get uh, get underway. I'd like to start with Perak Base, the second chapter. Uh, I hope you have a text with you. Actually, it's not essential on this occasion, but it is nice to have. After his uh, drunkenness had um, um, abated, and he has sort of regained some consciousness, and he's now, it's the morning after, he remembers Vashti, he remembers what she did, and she remembers what, and he remembers what was decreed against her. So, of course, we recall the context of the demise of his wife, uh, the queen, uh, Vashti, and uh, Alashir begins by asking, why does this uh, event, meaning the Purim story, why was it necessary for the redemption of the Jewish people to bring to be brought about through Esther? And Mordechai, in a way, is the uh, the, the real um, like fulcrum here. I mean, Esther is the heroine. Mordechai is a bit behind the scenes. Uh, I mean, it's let's say natural that a man would be in a leadership role, and we find that other redeemers are take the form, especially Moshe Rabbeinu and others. Uh, you know, maybe Ezra or Nehemiah, we're talking about personalities who are men. Why on this occasion was it necessary for a, uh, let's say, um, companion, and he uh, proves that don't think that Esther was just subordinate, he demonstrates that Esther was a, a um, equal uh, companion or partner, of course they were related as well, but she was a partner in this in this drama, he says, why was there a need for two redeemers? Why not just one? And how did she become the queen? Of course, we know, but he wants to analyze it. He says uh, she became a queen through a beauty pageant. I mean, is that the way to choose a queen? It's an unusual. I mean, uh, the fact that Achishverosh was fond of beautiful women is not surprising. But usually, uh, uh, not just uh, relationships or marriage, but at the royal level, they are chosen for reasons of political alliances and reasons of family, uh, pedigree, uh, frequently um, royal shiduchim uh, are brought about through uh, not just through, but they are family members. They are related in ways. All the European royal houses are inter interrelated in various ways. For example, and that was true in antiquity as well. It, this is a strange way to choose a choose a wife. So he explains the following. He says that at the party that we uh, not going to you know review it in detail. It's familiar to us all. At the party with which the uh, book of Esther begins. So there were Sarei Parasumadai. There were ministers, uh, courtiers, and political, uh, uh, you know, heavyweights uh, from Paras, Umadai, Persia, and Media. And he says there was laddish banter, what we would call today, uh, you know, at this party. And they were discussing, the guys were discussing who has the most beautiful women. Is it the Persian women? Is it the Median women? You know, who's the most beautiful, uh, you know, the, all the beautiful women in the world, they're discussing where where are the are the, the, the prettiest girls, like the old Beach Boys a song, and not that I've ever heard of the Beach Boys. So uh, the king says, actually, my wife is the most beautiful. She's not Persian or she's not Median. She is, um, what does she say? She is a Kasdi, which means she was a, a Babylonian. But according to our tradition, she was the daughter or granddaughter of, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. So she was Babylonian. He said, she's the most beautiful. So they called his bluff. They said, she's the most beautiful. Bring her on. You know, let's see. Let's, let, let, we'll, let, we, we'll, we'll judge for ourselves. But she, uh, we want to see how beautiful he is. So she's got to come naked because if she's wearing all her royal robes and gowns and other things, we won't be able to tell. So she has to come naked. Then we'll have a chance to, to make a judgment. So probably the king was happy with that. 
um, uh, Vashti was not. As we know, she stood him up and that left him exposed and humiliated and therefore he had her executed. Although it doesn't say so explicitly, but it seems that she was executed. Certainly she's never heard from again. The next day, this is how, where our, our uh, chapter two begins. Feshwaj woke up. He remembered what happened. He remembered Vashti, his love for Vashti. And not only that, not only does he love her, but he needs her as well. Because he was saying how beautiful she was, but she was also his key to the, to the, to the throne because he married into royalty. And he remembers what was decreed against her, which means that uh, he recognizes that really it was wrong for him to insist that the queen appear before the men in such a manner. And she was within her rights to tell him, uh, no way, Jose. And therefore, Akashroj is feeling a bit lame. Besides which, he needs a wife. He's lonely already. So his advisors come up with a plan. Uh, it's a positive base. Uh, verse 2, Let's have a beauty pageant. People should choose you, should send emissaries, um, uh, representatives of the uh, government, the crown, uh, to all the different regions and provinces, and they should select the most beautiful damsels from around the land, from all your 127 provinces, and you decide who you're going to choose, and then she really will be the most beautiful. It won't be subject to people saying, well, you didn't compare your wife to this woman or to that woman from this country or from that province or from that background, because Akhesho said, I have, I've uh, chosen the most beautiful girls from in the entire empire, and I've decided which one is the most beautiful to me. Problem is, of course, if you just use that method, meaning you choose only for looks, then as I said before, the, the king could be uh, uh, could end up with someone who's completely unsuited uh, for the role. So al says that Ahasuerus had a system. He didn't just send home the ones who were not selected. He kept them for his harem. So all of these girls who came to the palace to try out for their role, they all remained in the harem. He was able to choose the queen. Only one is the queen. All the rest are just girls from the, that he keeps in the, in the harem. He chooses one to be the queen. And then he can choose based on charm, intelligence, uh, you know, other qualities, not just a pretty face, as my sister-in-law uh, in Los Angeles says, a bimbo. Uh, no, he's able to choose someone who has the right qualities to be the queen as well, but he's also the most beautiful, or certainly he can say, I find her the most beautiful. And of course, as we know, Esther is, is the girl. So it's not long after that when uh, we read in Pasuk Hey, verse five, uh, in my, I've got the article here, it's printed in heavy typeface because it's one of the psukim that, according to the Minhag, we say out loud, the tzibur, the congregation, says it out loud um, before the uh, one who reads the Megillah does so as well. That's uh, mentioned in early sources. Anyway, Pasuk He was a Benjamite. From the from the tribe of Benjamin and Ishu uh, Yaya So the uh, uh, Al Sheikh quotes the Medrash, and the Medrash says that when we have an expression of Haya, like Ishu Haya or Umosha Haya Roetzov, uh, the expression Haya he was, it's like a literary device. It foreshadows the uh, future greatness. In other words, the um, the uh, destiny of this individual is foreshadowed with the word vahaya. Ishihudi haya, uh, a, a Jewish man was, which really doesn't just mean Jewish, means from the tribe of Yehuda. It was from Yehuda on one side, one side of the family, from Benjamin on the other side. Uh, so it implies, it hints to his uh, like destiny. So it says about Moshe, Moshe haya ro'et, it means he, Moshe is going to be the redeemer. And in a similar way, it foreshadows the fact that Mordechai is destined to be the one to redeem the Jewish people. That's great, but it begs the question again, if that's the case, why do we need Esther? Why was Esther like an essential, as we find, as we know, uh, 
a, a critical uh, part of the team that was responsible for the redemption of the Jewish people, if it's all here, evidently, the role of Mordechai, the place of Mordechai. So al Sheikh looks at it in the following way. He explains, he asks the question, which the Gemara also asks, we would all wonder, and it's not really explicit in the book of Esther itself, what uh, Avera brought the Jewish people to such a state of desperation so that Haman rose to prominence. Haman sought to avenge himself on the Jewish people in their entirety. Haman hatched a plot which we would today call genocidal, and the Jewish people were in mortal peril. Of course, we can see in the Megillah uh, what aroused Haman's anger, and we know that Haman is a descendant of Agag, so he's from Amalek, he hates the Jews anyways, and for a pretense, but from a philosophical or from a theological standpoint, what Avera made the Jewish people deserving of such a threat, even though, of course, in the end, they were, they were rescued. So there are two opinions which are mentioned in the Gemara, and he quotes the Medrash at length, and he explains as follows. Actually, before he, he goes into that, he quotes another Medrash. So listen to this fascinating Medrash. It's in Esther Rabbah. Uh, the Medrash says as follows. Ma pesha Yaakov achatas beis yudi shekorasam hara ha So he says we find two opinions in the sages. In one medrash, it says, It is evident from one source in the medrash that their uh, state of uh, desperation and peril was the result of the fact that they participated in this grand Mardi Gras, this uh, 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 banquet with which the book of Esther opens. The king had a big Mardi Gras for 180 days and then a further party just for the people of Shushan a further week and they were living it up as we were hinting to earlier uh, al Sheikh says about the laddish banter about all of the drinking and the, the king was, was uh, well inebriated by that point and we can imagine that this party is not a place for a, a Jewish Excuse me. For a uh, for God fearing Jewish uh, 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 family or community to be, and uh, this actually figure he doesn't explain, but the menu says there were eighteen thousand five hundred Jews who went to participate to to uh, to live it up and to participate in the party. Now I thought that number eighteen thousand five hundred is uh, you know. You might think it's an exaggeration. Uh, perhaps it is. Perhaps there's a meaning to it. But I can tell you that such numbers are not uh, beyond the realm of possibility. There was a wedding, a Hasidic wedding in uh, Yerushalayim about 10 years ago. A Belza Enikel, there are 25,000 uh, Hasidim at the wedding. Apparently some had to bring binoculars in order to see. They were so far away from the action. And uh, I think the groom uh, was a, a grandson of the Belza Rebbe. He was 18 years old. So, you know, if 25,000 people can come to see an 18-year-old get married, then you can imagine that uh, large numbers would have flocked to this great party in Shushan. So the Medrash says like this, that because there was the Jews all went to the party and they were living it up, and by the way, it wasn't long after the Khurban Habayis, not long after the destruction of the temple, it was... Uh, 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 by his, by the reckoning, by the reckoning of Achashua, she was seventy years. Perhaps he was a bit early uh, reckoning in the wrong way. But it was, as I say, only within a couple of generations after the Khurban, according to the well-known tradition mentioned in the Gemara. Even the Balkriya hints to it. The Chelim Mikhelim Shonim that they actually used some of the vessels from the temple, from the Beis HaMikdash, for this party. So the Jews should not have been there, certainly should not have been celebrating, but they were. So listen to this. Miyad Ahmad Satan v'Hilshin Aleihem, the Satan arose, and he denounced the Jewish people before the Almighty. And Hashem said to the Satan, Bring a uh, scroll, and I'm going to write a decree of annihilation against the Jewish people. So according to Rabbi Ishmael in the Medrash, this was the Avon for which they were subject to the terrible decree. 
And the Medrash itself indicates that as well. We'll see another opinion shortly. The Medrash continues. Here's a fascinating thing. Halach Eliyahu. So Eliyahu Hanabi, he's the great defender of the Jewish people. So he went to the Avos HaOlam, to the patriarchs, and he said to them, uh, intercede for a part, uh, with Hashem on behalf of the Jewish people. There is this decree of annihilation against them. So this is what the Medrash says. Im chatu man if they sin, what can we do for them? So then Eliyahu went to Moshe. And Moshe said, Vamarlo al hatsar hazos. He said to Moshe, what will you answer? What will you speak up? And what, what is going to be your, your reaction to this news? Ki ba'ovanim ad mashber. Your, your, uh, your people, the Jewish people, that you sacrificed yourself to such an extent, you redeemed them, you brought them out of Mitzrayim, you gave them the Torah, and now it's there, they're on the, the, the brink of annihilation. Amalo Moshe, klum yesh adam kasher so dar. Moshe said, is there no one worthy in that generation who can... Um, whose merit or whose inspiration, or whose influence can intercede uh, and, and, and can redeem the generation. Amalo Yevakesh Rachamim, who, Misham, tell him that he should plead for mercy from where he is, and I will plead for mercy from where I am, and maybe together, if the decree is written in blood, then there's no hope. But if it's written in mortar or in, in pitch, uh, something that can be can be washed away, then he says, then our prayer will be answered. That's the fascinating medrash. So he asks a few, uh, Al Sheikh asks a few questions. Why is it that the Avos were despairing? Uh, why did they immediately say, what can we do if they've seen the man Salem? What can we do for them? And for whatever the reason that you may give for the explaining why Avram Yisak and Yaakov despaired, why is it that Moshe did not? Why is it that Moshe stood up for them? And what's the meaning of that statement, excuse me, which Eliyahu said to Moshe, what will you say about this peril? He didn't say that to the Avos, he only said it to Moshe. And what is the meaning of written in blood or written in, in pitch or in mortar or some other kind of material which maybe can be, can be washed away, water soluble? So he says the following. He explains or he suggests that the Medrash says, a different Medrash, that at the time of the Khurban, Yirmiyah, the prophet Jeremiah, also he was pleading with the Jewish people. He was remonstrating. He was rebuking. He was trying every possible method to inspire them, to influence them, to do tshuva before it was too late. And then when it appeared as if the Jewish people were not listening to him, in fact, they were spurning him and imprisoning him. Kara la'avos ula Moshe. He called to the patriarchs, he called to Moshe and was to garnish help him. Unfortunately, the temple was destroyed. The exile uh, took, took, um, took its uh, toll and it was curtains for the generation. I mean, not in terms of per of uh, perishing, uh, but the exile and the destruction of the temple. So here we find that Moshe said, uh, we, but here Eliyahu is more persistent. And he says to Moshe, Ma ta'anel hatsar hazos. So he explains the difference is that Haman was confident and he was uh, wickedly gleeful at the prospects of the success of his plan because he was, uh, uh, because the poor, the goral, the lottery fell out on Adar. And he said, that's great because Adar is the month of the death of Moshe, the great redeemer, the great protector of the Jewish people. Moshe died in Adar. So that is a very propitious month for me to triumph over the Jewish people. According to that, Moshe has like a personal uh, responsibility. In other words, Moshe, not that he, it's his fault for dying, but he has a personal like connection to this um, threat because the month of Adar is the month in which Haman felt the absence of Moshe, the death of Moshe, means that the Jewish people are toast in this month. So therefore, 
Eliyahu was saying to, to Moshe, Moshe, don't just take it sitting down. What are you going to do? What response do you have? So Moshe had a plan. And he said, uh, you know, maybe there's someone worthy in that generation. What's the significance of written in blood or written in, in pitch or some other material? Uh, of course, you know, symbolically blood represents like a mortal uh, decision, something which is like uh, uh so it's sealed in blood. It's a way of saying that that this is de definitive. There's no no turning back. But he says that there's a remez here to the other opinion as to why the Jewish people were worthy of punishment and faced this mortal threat of annihilation in the form of Haman. And that opinion is hishtachavu latzelem. They bow down to an idol in the days of Nebuchadnezzar. The Jewish people were challenged or were, were, were um, I wouldn't say exactly forced on pain of death, but uh, it was certainly, they were put under terif terrific pressure to bow to an idol. Now, this idol was like a, a symbol of the superiority and the kingship and the power of Nebuchadnezzar. It wasn't exactly uh, an act of, of idol worship. And the Jewish people who did so, they did it only uh, as a as a show of respect. They did it just like as a as a way of uh, uh, performing an action that was perfunctory. They didn't really mean it. They didn't, in their hearts, uh, accept the idol as the, the 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 god. And it wasn't a rejection of the God of Israel. And that's what the Gemara says, that the uh, the Tamidim asked Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, what was the cause? And he said, they said, uh, 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 they said to him, yeah, but they, they didn't really mean it. It was just for show. So he said to them, yeah, and that's why the threat ultimately also was just for show, meaning it didn't come to pass. But of course, the Jewish people didn't realize that at the time. And it was for them, it was definitely a, a, a mortal threat. So the al says, it seems that the patriarchs who said, well, there's no hope for the Jewish people. If they've sinned, what can we do for them? Evidently took the view or understood that the Jewish people genuinely worshiped uh, um, idols. And in that case, they were indeed uh, deserving of death. So if that's what Moshe, I'm sorry, not the, the patriarchs, but when Moshe said, if it's bidam, meaning the dam representing uh, uh, idolatry, because uh, if a city is guilty of idolatry, what's called irhani dachas, then the judgment is whether it ever happened is doubtful. But according to the Torah, the judgment would be against such a city. They die by the edge of the sword, a, a bloodbath. So dam symbolizes that the Jewish people were guilty of a mortal uh, a sin, a sin for which the death, the, the punishment is death, and that would be the symbolism of written in blood. Moshe, then I can't help him. But if it's the Su'uda, and here's an interesting distinction, important distinction. If they really worship an idol, so this is a theological uh, betrayal of the most severe sort for which Jews have given up their lives throughout history. Lo aleinu lo aleichem should never happen in the future, but it certainly is a, a fact of Jewish history many times. They give up a, per, a, a man, a woman, they give up their lives rather than commit an act of idolatry. But if the sin was the other possibility, that they participated in that debaucherous party, even though it was certainly wrong, but then, says al it was Hanas Haguf. They did it because they wanted the pleasure of all the wine, the women, the song, the food, the dancing, the atmosphere, hobnobbing with the great and the good. There, there was the lure of a party time very hard to resist that. What about the FOMO, as they say nowadays? I didn't say it in my days, but it's a neologism. Yeah, FOMO, fear of missing out. All teenagers and others are subject to it. So they, everyone else is going to the party. Did you say me too? That's another uh, contemporary term. They want to be part of it as well. So if that's the case, that's called written petit, like in, in a, a mortar or pitch or some material, chemer, which is like Homer. In, in other words, it's just materialism. It's just physical pleasure. And that attraction, although it's wrong, but it's not as uh, onerous. And it's possible to, to, to roll it back, to dial it back. 
So the Gemara says that when, like I quoted a few minutes ago, that when they, they bowed down to the idol, it was just upon him. It was just like for sure. They didn't really mean it. Uh, and actually, this is still applicable even nowadays. Uh, thankfully, uh, idolatry is not very commonplace any longer. Uh, but a person should not bow down or yeah, even to an image of an idol, even if it's just happenstance. A person should not prostrate himself in the direction of a crucifix or something like that. Uh, um, Ruth and I saw recently a clip. You can find it very easily as well. There's a woman called Rivka Kravitz, and uh, she was the chief of staff of President Ruven Rivlin for a long time. And uh, she met all of the great, uh, the great and the good uh, uh, all over the world uh, because she was uh, traveled with uh, with the president of Israel all the time. And she met the Pope on one occasion. She was very concerned about it because Rivka Ravitz is not just a Jewish woman, but she is a uh, from woman. She went to Beis Yaakov in Geula, the most uh, devout Beis Yaakov in the city. And she is a mother. Uh, she is a, a, a one of 10 children. She's a mother of 12 children. She's the daughter-in-law of Rabbi Avram Ravitz, who was an MP for uh, Degel HaTorah years ago. Bikitsur, she's a from woman and a woman of great talent and great um, uh, dignity as well and, and diplomacy. She doesn't shake hands with men. So she told the uh, her um, handlers, be sure to tell the Pope, I don't shake hands with him. Well, it seems they forgot to tell him. So after the president shook hands with the Pope, he said to the to the Pope, Pope Francis, it happened in just a few years ago, in uh, 2015, I think, uh, he said to Pope Francis, this is my chief of staff, she doesn't shake hands with men. So he extended her, his, maybe the Pope extended his hand, and she put her hands behind her. And so it was understood that those who don't shake hands to the Pope, they just bow as a matter of uh, a protocol. She couldn't bow because the Pope, don't forget, wears a crucifix. She couldn't bow to him and she wouldn't bow to him. The Pope bowed to her instead. That's a remarkable photograph, which you can find online with the greatest of ease. Uh, so this is Rivka Ravitz and the Pope. You can look it up. So uh, it was just lip on him, though, but even so, they shouldn't have done it. So says the al a, a, a beautiful idea. The problem, and he proves it from the management of time, for our time is nearly up. The problem is that the Jewish people not long before had worshipped so many different idols. And it wasn't just for show. It was because of the influence of the corrupt kings of, of uh, Israel and the kings of Yehuda. And you can read the book of Kings and, and uh, you know, if it doesn't distress you, then um, uh, I don't know, maybe you've got a different parish than I have, because from what I understand, uh, the, the, the description of all of those kings, so many, one was worse than the next in many cases. The kids are, the, the base of England was destroyed because of idolatry. And they went into exile because of idolatry. Says al Sheikh, they were in the process of recovering from that terrible pattern. The Jewish people, the remnant who, who were still part of the Jewish nation, were putting idolatry behind them. But when they bowed to the idol of Nebuchadnezzar, and when they went to the party of Achashverosh, it like renewed the uh, not just the memory, but the the uh, kitrug, the sort of um, uh, criticism, the heavenly condemnation was uh, um, weighing upon them once again. It's like he used the expression chosev and neor for those who are familiar with some of the principles in in uh, in Isra Veheta. Chosev and neor, it like reawakened that. Uh, um, uh, uh, behavior on their part, it's almost as if it like reminded them of the bad old days. And that's what Moshe Rabbeinu meant when he said that, that if it's written in, in blood, then I can't, I can't help them. The reality was, of course, that the Jewish people uh, had moved on just about from the idolatry. And although they, they did participate 
in the in in the uh, that banquet, but they were able to recover from it. Our time is just about up. Uh, I just want to end with uh, to answer the question that we asked earlier: Why was there a need for two redeemers? So the simple answer, which he says, there were two redeemers because of the two sins, the two averos. It was because of participating in the banquet. And it was because of the sin of idolatry, which may or may not have been genuine, but even if it was not genuine, it still brought to mind, so to speak, it recalled their uh, um, uh, baleful pattern of the previous generations when they did worship idols. So he says another idea as well, an additional thought. He says that Mordechai was righteous, but he had a certain... Uh, uh, his ability to stand up to Haman was compromised for the following reason. Who was Haman? He was a descendant of Agag. Agag was the king of Amalek. And of course, therefore, Haman was an, 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 an Amaleki. But in particular, he was a descendant of Agag. Now, Agag actually uh, was killed. He was killed he was captured in battle and he was killed. But he had a chance, nevertheless, the last night of his life to consort with a slave girl. And from that union, a child was born. And ultimately, generations, centuries later, excuse me, Haman uh, was able to, to come into this world. Who was responsible for failing to execute? a god in timely fashion who made him into a captive of war rather than killing him on the battlefield it was shaul hamelech king saul shaul was an ancestor of mordechai so because mordechai's early ancestor king shaul shaul hamelech was actually responsible for enabling a Haman to come into this world for failing to execute Agag in timely fashion. So therefore, Mordechai did not quite have the strength, the merit to single-handedly save the Jewish people. He needed Esther as well. He needed Esther as well. So he says that, that uh, Mordechai represents, so Mordechai and Esther were needed in order, between the two of them, to uh, save the Jewish people from the peril that came about because of those two Averos. Now, I'll just end with the following. Which of the two defended or was the corrective for which Aver? Now, here, uh, uh, I have to say that al Sheikh has a certain approach. I would like to very humbly suggest that, to me, the opposite seems to be more compelling. I'll tell you what I would like to suggest. Mordechai lo kamvelozan. He did not move a muscle. He did not even stand up, let alone prostrate himself. When Haman walked by, everybody else prostrated themselves. Mordechai did not. Because Haman talked himself up as a god, or maybe he had a little idol with him, and Mordechai refused to bow to Haman. And that symbolizes Mordechai's Pride and his refusal to bow to any um, other source of authority other than God himself. That is Mordechai, the corrective for the Avodah Esther was the corrective for the banquet because the Jewish people were so keen to participate in that great party. And Esther said, Sumu alai lai levayom for three days. Esther said, I'm going to fast. The Jewish people should fast. Even my maidens will all fast for three days, and then I'll approach the king. So I would like to suggest, although he says the opposite, I would like to suggest that Mordechai was the corrective for the Avodah Zarah, the idolatry, and um, Esther is the corrective for the uh, sin of participating in the banquet. So these two together brought about the redemption of the Jewish people. And with this, we've also explained why Moshe Rabbeinu, so to speak, got involved as well, according to this uh, medrash. I would just like to end with a, an observation uh, of a contemporary sort of application of what we've learned tonight. Uh, Jewish pride, a refusal to, um, like, uh, uh, render ourselves worshipers of 
contemporary forms of idolatry, uh, I think remains the order of the day. Grass, uh, idolatry of antiquity is no longer fashionable, but secularism is very much fashionable. Secularism has run amok. Uh, uh, agnosticism, atheism, uh, the, the, the secularism of the day, not just in Britain, in Europe, in the Western world, religion is, uh, certainly Christianity is, is in decline, Islam is on the rise, but Islam is not, not uh, um, idolatrous, but basically uh, we Jews are faced with the need to uh, re uh, renew and reinforce our convictions of what we believe in and what, what we know to be true. And in terms of the parties, so uh, the way that we celebrate on Purim and at other times is with genuine joy and inspiration, not through the uh, 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 base forms of celebration and parties that one encounters in, in, in other quarters. Uh, we uh, are able to find genuine joy and pleasure and delight and celebration in a context and an experience which is Jewishly authentic and which is not less joyful because of that. So those are my thoughts and those are my uh, uh, reflections and um, pleased to be sharing with you something which I found very stimulating uh, in terms of my studies of al Sheikh on Esther. I've got a lot more pages to do. I can't promise to finish it this year. I don't think I will. But anyway, thank you for joining us and I wish everyone a Freilich and Purim, a wonderful Purim, a Purim of, of uh, a joy and uh, we should experience uh, only uh, good news, good tidings and uh, uh, for those who are with us at Kesha, we're doing uh, murder at the Purim feast on um, the, after Kiddush this uh, Shabbos. And uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you there if you're able to join us.